Amen. Just a couple quick announcements before we transition into our worship service this morning. Um, happy Sunday, first of all. Welcome to LifePoint Pentecostal Church, where Christ is worshipped, the word is preached, and where people are loved. This week's schedule is as follows. Everyone say Tuesday and Wednesday. Tuesday and Wednesday night, there is revival services in the sanctuary. Tuesday, Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. The doors will be open at 6.30 p.m. for prayer. We're going to be having evangelist Dylan Morgan um, come and minister. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be dynamic. And we're believing God for great things. That's on Tuesday and Wednesday night. Please come out if you can. It's going to be a powerful time in God's presence. Thursday night, th uh, Thursday night, there is no Lifeline group at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Center. There's no Lifeline this Thursday. Sunday morning, this is where we worship. How many people are excited to worship God and to lift up the one true name of the living God, Jesus Christ, this morning? We're glad you're here with us this morning. Let's all stand. Why don't you, why don't you step across the aisle and maybe greet somebody? I know there's some, some visitors in the house today. Would the usher prepare to come at this time? We're going to take up our Sunday morning tithes and offerings. Amen. There's a saying around here at LifePoint. It goes like this. The first time you come, you're VIP. And the second time you come, you're family. So why don't we make our first-time guests feel comfortable this morning? Let's give them a, a hand clap of appreciation for coming this morning. And just one more quick announcement before we transition. Please like, comment, and share our church page and post on your social media platforms. Let's spread the word about our home church. Amen. And last but not least, let's open this service in prayer. Would you join with me this morning, maybe by lifting up your hand with your voice? Let's pray together corporately this morning. Lord Jesus, we love you, God. We thank you, Jesus, for everything that you're doing in this place. We thank you for each and every individual that's here this morning, God. Lord, we have an expectation in our spirit that you're going to do something powerful in this place. We pray that your word would go forth this morning, God, and it would not return void, but that it would touch our hearts, God, that it would strengthen us, God, that it would minister to us in a powerful way, God. Lord, touch our pastor this morning as he ministers, as he preaches the word of God. Anoint him, God, and use him in a powerful way. And I just pray, God, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth this morning, God. And we pray as we lift you up, as we praise you, God, that your presence would come down in a tangible way. And that we would feel you, God. Because in you, Jesus, we move and we breathe and we have our being. And we thank you for showing up this morning, God, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Who's ready to worship this morning? Thank you, Jesus.
other names fade away. Jesus, take your place. Jesus, take your place. Let all the other names fade away. Let all the other names fade away. Until there's only you, let all the other names fade away. Jesus, take your place.
worshiping you, Jesus. Oh, yes. There's no place. Why don't we just lift him up for a minute? Why don't you tell him in your own words, God, there's no place I would rather be this morning than here, God, in your house. I thank you this morning, God for this privilege, this opportunity, God. Oh, there's no other place, no other place on earth, God, this side of heaven, Jesus, that I'd rather be than here with you, God. Thank you. Come on, why don't we give God a hand clap of praise this morning. He's in the house. Come on, I feel his powerful presence moving in this place. And just, just for a second, just, just for a moment, as the kids go down to kids' life, you're dismissed to go downstairs and have a wonderful time having fun down in Sunday school. How about we as the adults just get our minds on Jesus? Come on. The Bible says that there are pleasures on his right hand forevermore. That the goodness of the Lord is, is I, I feel like a lot of believers, we can live below our privilege. We can live below what God has promised us and what he has for us. And I just really feel today strongly that somebody here, come on, I know I want it to be me. Somebody here is about to receive a blessing, a promise, come on, a powerful door opening in your life and in your walk with God, everybody say in this season. Come on, somebody say, tis the season. Tis the season where God can do what God wants to do in this atmosphere. Just for one more minute, would you clap your hands, lift your hands, lift your voice, and just worship God. He's here this morning. Come on, somebody say, Lord, have your way. Everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. Give God one more hand clap of praise. You may be seated this morning. You may be seated. I, I want to take you to a wedding, amen. There's a lot of wedding talk going around, and, and I know quite a few couples, to be honest with you. Maybe it's because it's the holiday season that have been talking to me about getting married. And while I was praying and I was studying and I was saying, Lord, speak to me what I'm going to preach for Sunday morning, I felt the Lord say, well, let's go to a wedding. Amen. And, and I began to look at the wedding in Cana in Galilee, it's a very familiar story about the very first miracle of Jesus. Say amen if you know it. Amen. I'll give you a chance to turn there. We're going to go to John chapter 2 this morning, verses 1 through 11. And I'm going to read it in the NLT version. And one more time, let's just give a welcoming hand clap to all our visitors again. That We're just so happy that we are continuing, even in this very cold weather. To grow as a church and, and for the family of God has just been, been coming out. And there's one way to stay warm in the cold, and that's just having a red-hot worship service. Praise God. The Lord has been moving this morning in the worship. I thank God for that. Okay, chapter 2 in the book of John. I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Follow it with me. The Bible says, The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples, somebody say, and his disciples, come on, they were always partying with Jesus. Come on, they were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, my, my mom used to do the same, she told me a lot of things too. And she said, they have no more wine. He said, dear woman, that's not our problem. Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. There's a divine moment in a season. Everybody say amen. There's a divine time when God is ready to do what God is going to do. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Say amen. If we do it Jesus's way. We're going to see those Jesus miraculous results. 
And standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. And when the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. And when the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though, of course, the servants knew. Come on, the servants of the Lord. Lord always know what he's doing. Amen. He called the bridegroom over. He said, a host always serves the best wine first. He said, then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. Hallelujah. And this miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. I want to say that again. This is the first time that Jesus had revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. If I've got a few disciples in here that believe in him and you want to see his glory today, would you just begin to help me pray that the word would go forth, that God would speak to our spirits today. Lord, encourage us in our holy faith. Build us up, God. Speak to our hearts, God. Anoint your word, God. It's your anointing that destroys the yoke. Have your way today, God. We want to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. And everybody said in Jesus' name, one more time, it's the season. Let's worship God. Let's celebrate His presence today. Life point, don't sit down on me today. Help me preach. Come on, amen. Around the holidays and family gatherings, it's commonplace for many people to get together. But there are many who are alone over the holidays, and, and church offers a welcoming place for many people over Christmas during the new year to join us for our upcoming special services like next week, our revival Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Our Christmas program is coming up, and I'm excited to see the kids involved with that. And uh, we're going to be home for Christmas Eve service this year. I'm excited about that. And in January, we will be starting the year off with a prayer and fasting focus where we will be gathering at the church for 21 days of deepening in mid-January. Uh, and everyone is welcome to join us. Amen. It's a great way to start the year growing closer to God, growing deeper in our relationship with God through prayer and fasting. Amen. I just wanted to promote some of those things over the next month and a half. And much like family gatherings and holiday parties in my text this morning, we find Jesus also celebrating at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Often overlooked, this candid look at the Son of God reveals the Lord's desire to fellowship. And I find it truly amazing in this story how he engaged with people. And I would suggest that he had a lot of fun, just like we do as Christians, eating together, sharing meals together, and generally just doing life together, celebrating together during every season of life. I wonder if Jesus got like some cheese dip right here. That always happens to me at Christmas parties. I'll wear my Christmas uh, knitted vest, sweater, my sweater vest. Uh, uh, wonderful seniors here at the church literally knitted my face on a sweater. Come on, when you pull that out, nobody's beating that. When I go to a party, I'm wearing a, a sweater vest with my own face knitted on it. And it says Life Point on the back, number one pastor. Come on, I love that. I love that, that knitted sweater. But if I wear that to a party, guaranteed I'm getting, the first thing I'm going to do is get cheese sauce on it, something on it. But Jesus, his first miracle occurred at this wedding. This was the first time Jesus revealed his glory or his deity. Many preachers have attempted to preach and teach about the significance of Jesus turning water into wine. I know he walked on water, he raised the dead, he healed the sick, but to his disciples, to his uh, apostles, those, those ones who walked with them closely, when they saw this begin, I imagine it was very exciting. And it's fitting that it happened at a party. It's very significant, I believe, that it happened 
at a party where he turned water into wine. I would suggest that the major significance was that soon the new wine of the New Testament born again experience was to come to pass. This experience was provided to mankind by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, which was the whole reason, remember, why God became flesh and dwelt among us as a baby in a manger here during the holidays. Tis the season to remember what God has done for us and how he gave his life. He was born to die, to die on the cross for our sins. You see, it was always prophesied from the Garden of Eden that he would come and and that he would deal with sin once and for all. But my intention today is not so much to go deeper into the doctrinal significance of Jesus' first miracle. However, I want to draw your attention to simply the humanity of Jesus. The humanity of Jesus. Think about it. Probably smiling, laughing, not indignant, not out of order, just enjoying himself with his disciples. And just to establish this quick point, whether the wine was alcoholic or fermented wine or not, many theologians believe Jesus wouldn't have miraculously created dead wine or decayed wine, which fermented wine is, but they think it was unfermented or simply grape juice, because the word translated for wine in the Old Testament and the New Testament can actually refer to grape juice or alcoholic wine. I've been asked this question. If I've been asked one question the most from people about the Bible, is this always like, does the Bible say it's okay to drink? (laughs) I hear it all the time. Unfermented wine was often served with food during the feast, and the alcoholic wine was served after the feast. That's why the governor of the feast made the comment that he expected it to be served first. Who knows whether it was alcoholic, was non-alcoholic, fermented, unfermented, I don't know. But either way, regardless, we know that Jesus didn't get hammered. Come on, come on, we know that. We know he didn't get drunk at the wedding. The the Bible says in the New Testament and the Old Testament that drunkenness is a sin. And Jesus lived a sinless life, which was necessary for him to redeem mankind, to be the perfect sinless sacrifice, to provide salvation for all humanity. Are you glad that he did provide the gift of eternal salvation? And it's the season, it's the season for us to remember that, that God gave us the ultimate gift of laying down his life for our salvation. So tis the season. Turn to your neighbor and say, tis the season. Tis the season to celebrate the birth of our Savior, to lift up the name of Jesus and to get ready. Somebody say, get ready. For the marriage supper of the Lamb this Christmas as we celebrate, let us celebrate Jesus. Amen. What he did on the cross. Let us celebrate that we can look forward to heaven. That we can look forward to as the people of God. That we can look forward to breakthrough and blessing and God's precious promises. Merry Christmas, church. Come on. His word is a gift. Come on, his word is a gift. His love is a gift. Salvation is a gift. I feel like somebody's saying, hey, give me that gift. Come on, if God has something for me, I want it. I don't know about you, but I'm still a big kid on Christmas. I told my wife and my kids, I said, don't give me socks for Christmas. My dad, he was okay with that. I'm not okay with that. If I get socks, they better be like Star Wars socks or something. They better be a big deal. I got Star Wars socks last year, so. It's putting that in there. Come on, the Holy Ghost is a promise. Say amen. Come on, it's a gift, the Bible says, a promise from God. Come on, I want somebody to help me. Lift up your voice. Somebody say, tis the season. Come on, to be jolly, to have joy, unspeakable and full of glory in your life by the power of God's Spirit in your life. Tis the season. I'm excited because the truth is every season is God's season. Come on, I I feel it all the time that we got to remember that that we make Christmas about Jesus, and I I think that's great. And, uh, And I believe not only is it the season to remember what Jesus did for us, the gifts that he has given us, but it's the season, and receive this this morning when I say it, it's your season. 
Come on, there's many different seasons in our life, but I, I want you to get this concept. This season, it's your season. Don't miss it today. It's your season of blessing and charity and generosity and abundant life. Church, it's your season. And I'll tell you why. Let me ask you this question. You guys tell me this. Is Christmas the season of perpetual hope or is it a pagan holiday? I'll wait. I'll wait. I think people have the different opinions on that. Come on. Somebody say it's both. It's both. That's the problem. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, such and so forth. Glory to God in the highest. Jesus is the reason for the season. All that. And I believe Jesus was born actually around April or springtime. Most people think that who have studied it. But not December 25th. We have Christianized the winter solstice. Give your best gift to Jesus over the holidays. Come on. I heard all that. I'm not against all that. I'm preaching all that right now. We claimed it and made it about Jesus. As apostolic believers, we believe every day is about Jesus. Come on, every single day. Not just December 25th. But for thousands of years, the winter solstice, specifically the day before the longest day of the year, on or around Christmas, people worship the devil. Come on. Wiccans, the occult, all kinds of ancient evil occurs to this day. Come on, somebody. On or around all these dates, is, uh, Easter or Ishtar, summer solstice, Samhain or Halloween, it's a pagan harvest celebration. And winter solstice, or what the Catholics called Christ Mass, is basically where we're at now. And I may have missed some devil holidays there, but I don't worship the devil, so I'm not aware anymore of any of their holidays. So, But I will gladly worship Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, on any high holy day, they worship the devil or any other religion, come on, uh, that worships a false god. Ramadan, I worship Jesus. Come on, hallelujah. Kwanzaa, I worship Jesus. Easter, Halloween, Christmas, any day, every day, come on, especially Sunday, Saturday, Sabbath day, day and night, night and day, 24-7, 365 days a year. It's all about Jesus. Hallelujah. Tis the season, and it's always in season to worship Jesus Christ. I have felt a simplicity in my spirit in my ministry recently to keep it simple and to lift up Jesus. Come on, and if I said anything today that, that gets in your spirit, I want to say this. Jesus Christ, God manifested in the flesh, who died on the cross for our sins, he is the most high God. There is none other God beside him. It's real simple. When you call on the name of Jesus, you're calling on the name of God, and there's authority in that name. Tis the season to walk in the authority of God. Come on, what does Christmas mean to you? I hope you don't worship the devil. No offense to people who do. Basically, anybody who doesn't worship Jesus Christ by default, essentially, well, anyways, the point of my sermon today is any season when you worship Jesus is your season. Come on, let me tell you why. There's an authority that comes to a believer when you realize, wait a second, one thing I have to just get out of the way is, is Pastor Brent doesn't care about political correctness. You got to pray for me. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I'm like, you know what, if it ain't in the Bible, I'm not going to tiptoe around what I have to say to be a believer. If it's in the Bible, I'm going to speak it with authority and by faith I'm going to believe it. And God always is a man of his word. God's word will come to pass if you stand on it. But if you make excuses for it, if you tiptoe around what the Bible says and you, you, you just constantly, you know, you, you speak in riddles and you don't, you know, you're not going to have authority. The, the Bible says you've got to bind the strong man. And if somebody comes to, to raid your house, they come to break in your house and tie you up and steal your stuff, you know, you better not say, please don't do that, sir. Please don't come in and ransack my home and steal everything. You know, don't, don't, don't disturb me and my family. You better be prepared to fight for your soul and for your family, for your home, for your salvation. Somebody say amen. 
Come on, tis the season. Have that authority in God and, and to bind the strong man. We have authority over these things. And I feel like in this political correct climate, sometimes we get a little bit apprehensive on how to take authority and deal with things. But I want to give something to you today. Tis the season for authority in God when you can start to pray for your family and blessing and the promises of God and against this wicked world and come against things even here in our city and say, no, in the name of Jesus, we come against these things such and so forth that are happening in our lives. You have authority, church. you got to walk in it. Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, verily, verily, that means pay attention. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Somebody say amen. amen. And greater works than those shall he do. And I heard my pastor tell me before, that doesn't mean we're greater than Jesus. That means that we're going to do greater works numerically in number than he did in the three and a half years of his ministry. Come on, I believe that what God has promised us in his word could come to pass. And I believe we can walk in that greater works authority. Praise God. He said, I, because this is why I go unto my Father and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, come on somebody, I will do it. If you ask it in his name, God's going to do it. There's that glorification again. Come on, he said that my Father, come on, will be glorified in the Son. He was talking about the deity and how he was robed in flesh and how he came to get a job done. When Jesus was born in that manger, and we talk about that around Christmas time, and, and Mary had no room in the inn, and, and then there was a silent night because Joseph didn't make any reservations. Maybe, maybe Mary was upset with him. I, I don't know how that went, but the truth is there's more to it than just a baby in a manger. There's an authority in the incarnation where God became flesh that we understand that the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God in a believer's life anoints us to do greater works and to powerfully walk in an anointing and in an authority. In an authority. I feel like it's a gift. I feel like God's giving us the gift of this authority and it's the season for it. It's the season for it of giving gifts. Tis the season of generosity. We, we serve a God who is generous. We don't serve a God that's stingy. God, God's going to bless your socks off. Amen. God is going to bless you, and he is going to uh, be, again, a man of his word. He, his, his promises will come to pass if you just will be uh, brave enough, courageous enough to have the faith to believe his word at face value to receive it. You see, tis the season of the fruit of the Spirit. If you've ever heard about that, everyone tries to put on a fake smile at Christmas. Everybody tries to be happy around the holidays, and, and a lot of people are not happy around the holidays. Say amen. I, I know some grumpy people over Christmas. I know people who are literally the Grinch. I got a friend, and his name is Mike, and he, he always says, bah humbug. And he, he'll go into, into 17 layers of, of why he doesn't like Christmas. I still love him. I still love him. But the truth is everybody's trying to be happy and, and, and be kind during the holidays. And I feel like the fruit of the Spirit ought to be shown by the church during the holidays. Come on. But I said it before, every season. Everybody say every season. Not just, the, not just the holidays, not just the Christmas season, but every season, I believe, can be a season of generosity and receiving God's promises and His blessing. And it's the season of the gifts of the Spirit. When I was, when I was studying, when I was praying to preach on this message, I felt the Lord say, now, now don't just get it all hyped up and tell them that I love them and I'm going to bless them and all that stuff. Show them how my gifts operate. Show them how they can walk in authority in the gifts of the Spirit. And if God ever wanted the opportunity to tell his church that now is the time, it's the end time, Jesus is coming back, we can't just go around and, and, and be nice and have a smile on our face as believers. We better walk in the gifts of the Spirit with the power and the authority of God to win souls, make disciples, come on, give the devil a black eye, and to have authority and power in God. Somebody say, tis the season. It's the season. This is your season. I, I don't know how to say it. We're just maybe, you know, putting you on notice today that it's your season to walk in boldness in Jesus Christ. 
Come on, if you receive that, clap your hands unto the Lord because that boldness, that boldness is necessary in this generation for us to, I want to preach you about two inches taller today when you leave the house of God to be able to live bold for Jesus. It's a season in your walk with God for growth and for strength and for blessing and God's power. 1 Corinthians 12 says the gifts of the Spirit are as follows. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the gift of faith, gifts of healing, gifts plural. Come on, if you've got a sore back, if you need a healing touch on your neck, if you've got a headache, you've got, come on somebody, you've got diabetes, whatever you need. The gifts plural are of healing. Are, are, I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus can heal what ails you today. That miracle healing power, that gift promise from God's word, the Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. And that healing is here for you today. Come on, it's a gift from God. The working of miracles, the gift of prophecy, discerning of spirits, diverse kinds of tongues. That's when you begin to speak a language you don't understand. And maybe you're preaching the gospel to somebody in a foreign language. The Bible goes on to say that there's also the interpretation of tongues. This idea that God can speak directly to his church through tongues and interpretation. And I believe somebody needs to hear me when I preach this to your spirit today. It's your season to learn and grow in walking in the gifts of the Spirit. It's a promise from God. It's not spooky. It's not something that you can go without, in my opinion. That the power of the Spirit of God moving in a believer's life, He wants to lead you and guide you into all truth to the place of your destiny. Now I'm just going to pastor for just a second. I want to tell somebody, you have a destiny. You have a place in the kingdom of God. You fit in a place where you can become greater. Everybody say greater. Greater year after year and specialize in places in the kingdom of God where he gave you gifts, talents, and ability. I bet you some people in this room can whistle. Amen. Raise your hand if you can whistle. (laughs) Come on. Who can't whistle? (laughs) There's some brave souls in the house. Listen, not everybody can do the same thing. Not everybody can do the same thing. Some people can't clap on beat. Come on, some people can. Some people are musical. Some people can, can uh, you know, be, maybe preach or whatever. But the truth is there are things in our walk with God that anybody can do. Come on, anybody can be faithful. Come on, that's true. In every marriage, in every relationship, every person can be faithful. Every person can give. Of your time, treasure in your talents, volunteering, supporting the church, tithes and offerings, all that stuff. We can, we can give. Anybody can do that. Even if you can't sing, you can't preach. Maybe you're not walking in the gifts of the Spirit and the miraculous and, and opening blind eyes when you pray for people. Come on. But do you believe that God can do that through you? That's all you need to have is faith to believe it. And I'm, I'm telling somebody, don't settle for a mediocre walk with God. Come on, it's the season. It's the time for you to start moving forward to challenge those things and to say, where do I fit? What gifts, callings, and abilities, supernatural promises from God are going to operate in my life? I feel like someone's picking up what I'm laying down today. It's your season. If you receive it, if you believe it, come on, you can walk in these things. When you start to pray and ask God, lead me and guide me into all truth. Help me to be discipled or to learn or to grow into some of these promises in your word. I feel like some people are like me and they want to get a gift. Amen for Christmas. Come on, you can get gifts from God. You can get gifts from God. You see, God's in the habit of giving gifts and we should do the same. Come on, I believe that. I I tell people all the time, God blesses us not just so that we can be blessed. He blesses us so we can bless other people. So that blessing that's flowing in your life, did you know every time you eat a meal, every time you give thanks to God, you're thanking Him because He provided you with the health, He provided you with the job, He provided you with the financial means. God provides everything we need. That air you're breathing right now, come on, that belongs to God, and He gave it to you. That health, come on, the strength, everything that you have in your life, it's a gift from God. And now once we have that understanding and we're thankful... We walk in thanksgiving. We start to give that to other people. If I could say one thing this morning, I would tell somebody, give somebody a second chance. 
Somebody hurt you. If somebody cut you off in traffic, somebody stepped on your toes at the bank when you're standing in line. I don't know what it is, but we get fed up. I know believers who get frustrated. (laughs) I'm one of them. And I'm just like, oh, I'm mad about this and the, the government and all this kind of stuff. I can get really worked up, but then I begin to thank God because I'm still alive. Every day above ground is a good day. Come on, if you're breathing air, you're living for God, you've got faith, then you've got hope. Come on, you can have power in your walk with God, and and you don't have to be a prisoner in your own mind of complaining and, and all those negative things that tear us down. It gets worse over the holidays. Somebody say amen. That weight, that pressure to be the best parent or to, to, to give the best to your kids and all this stuff. And, and people compare themselves among yourselves. And the Bible says that's not wise. And, and there's so much pressure over the holidays. But I pray that we would just put all that stuff down. It's complicated anyways. And just give our best gift to God. Let's focus on Him. Worship Him. Praise Him. He's the Prince of Peace. And that, that, that worship to God, it begins to, to spill over. And you begin to love other people and you begin to be thankful for what God has done. And you begin to be thankful for the people in your life. Thankful for your church. Come on, thankful for a pastor. Amen. Thankful for leaders. Thank you, Jesus, for people who are keeping me accountable. Maybe you got a sponsor, an accountability partner. If there's somebody in your life, if you have one friend or any family, you ought to thank God that you've got somebody in your life that cares about you. Why don't you be a person like that to somebody else? Just, just giving. It's the season of perpetual hope and of giving and generosity. You see, Jesus said there's two things that you can never give too much of. You can never give too much of. And and I want you to get this this morning. Everybody say worship. The Bible says the first commandment is to put God first in your life, to love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And I was... I was sitting on the couch the other day, and we did our daily devotion, and the Lord hit me with that scripture, and I'd never seen it this way before, but it's actually in the order of operation. Because your mind or your heart is the same thing, basically. It's, it's, it's not uh, the, the muscle that's pumping blood through your body. That, that word heart actually means your personality. It's, it's, it's that part of you that, that you have to decide. You make logical decisions. Uh, how many people know that Golgotha is the place of the skull? That place where Jesus died, the battle is in your mind. To live for God, the doubt, the fear, the unbelief, the, the pushing back against the things that we got to put on the helmet of salvation, amen, to block the attacks of the enemy and the doubt, the fear, the anxiety, depression, all of that. We can just say, hey, I'm going to guard my mind. And If you're too open-minded, your brain will fall out. If you're too closed-minded, God can't get nothing in there. Nobody can tell you. You think you know everything. But you've got to guard your heart, for out of it come the issues of life. Guard your mind. Okay, now watch this. If you love the Lord thy God with all your mind, the next thing it said was with your soul. That's, there's a place in your walk with God where you've got to start understanding the fear of the Lord. Okay? Your flesh is temporary. This is a vehicle Come on, we're, we're not physical beings having a spiritual experience on planet Earth. We're spiritual beings having a physical experience on planet Earth. You are an eternal soul. You are going to live forever in heaven for eternity or you exist in a place called hell for eternity. Because that spiritual part of us, it's eternal, okay? And if you give that to God, come on, that's what he's trying to save. That's why he died on the cross. That's why when we stumble and fall and fail God in the flesh, he'll forgive us. Why? Because he's after our soul. He's after our soul. And the last part is strength. Everybody say strength. Probably took some strength this morning to put your socks on. (laughs) I tell my wife, I said, man, I got to go on a diet. I'm having a hard time putting on my socks. I put on my Sorrells and my winter boots. Am I the only one? I get all sweaty before I even leave. I'm wearing a jacket. I'm putting the boots on and the gloves and everything. But it takes strength to live for God. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. You need some joy. You need to go to a church where you can have fun and the people of God are friendly and people shake your hand. And when you go through stuff, you don't got to pretend you're not happy. You don't got to pretend you have joy every minute of every hour. But you better have somebody in your life that will have a little joy when you're down to build you back up and to help you when you're going through a struggle. 
joy. Everybody say joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So when the Bible says, love the Lord thy God with all your mind, your soul, your heart, such and so forth, and the other, and the strength, it's talking about that joy. That's the per- perseverance. You're not going to give up, and you need to have that strength today. I want to build you up in, in your most holy faith that God would give you strength. And watch this. Worship is a lifestyle. Once you've made up your mind that you're going to put God first in your life, and you said, no, 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 my faith comes first. You know, going to church, reading my Bible, daily devotions, giving and the promises and the blessings of God. That's the priority of my life. And I'm not going to let anybody or anything get in between me and Jesus Christ. Get it out of the way. Don't let something get between you and the cross, my God. When you need to get to the foot of the cross because you need redemption for sin, is guilt and condemnation, and you feel like giving up, and you're this close to backsliding, you better not have ten hurdles to jump. Before you get to the cross, get that stuff out of your life and just keep it with you and him, you and Jesus. Keep that cross close. And that's what worship is. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is sacrifice. Abraham, when he took Isaac up the mountain, if you remember the story, he said, I and the lad go up yonder to worship. That's what Isaac said. Hey, uh, I see the wood. I see the knife. What, what, where's the sacrifice? And I got some bad news for you, LifePoint. You're the sacrifice. (laughs) You have to lay down your life, a living sacrifice. That sacrifice is worship. It's not easy to go to church all the time, to read your Bible, and to try to not live in sin and and to, to, you know, do all the commandments of the Word of God. But I thank God for the power of the Holy Ghost and the anointing of God that does it in us and through us. It doesn't rely on you to to have all the pressure on you all the time. But listen to this. If you would just lift your hands and worship, if you would praise him, if you would, come on, when you do your daily devotions at home and you just begin to talk to him, and all the people who can't sing, they sing to Jesus anyways in their living room. They just make a joyful noise and, and they worship. They put God first in their car. Have you ever seen somebody singing in their car at a stoplight? Come on, do that for Jesus. Amen. Worship him in spirit and in truth all the time. Put him first in your life. Worship means putting God first in everything. That worship is a lifestyle. It's not a Sunday thing. The second thing Jesus said you can't do enough of, you can't ever do too much of this, is love. Everybody say amen. Love to others. Love yourself. Loving yourself, it's, it's hard to do. You can't, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. It's important, guys, that we have this love first from God. If God loves you and he died for you, that means you're valuable whether you love yourself or not. I'm helping somebody right now, I feel it. God loves you, so you ought to love yourself even by faith. If you're a scoundrel, if you're no good and you feel like you're just in a bad way, you're always beating yourself up just by faith for one day. Come on, just for one day. Jesus said today is the day of salvation. If you can go 24 hours and just say, you know what, by faith, I love myself. Come on, I'm going to love people. I'm going to love God. I'm going to put them first in my life. It begins to turn into this generosity. Loving your neighbor. Come on, loving the world around us. It just seems to spill. Once you understand what God's done for you, it begins to get on other people. Come on, and then you start giving gifts. God gives us the gift of his love. God gives us the gift of his word. God gives us his promises and those blessings, and all of a sudden we start feeling obligated. Has somebody ever been so good to you that you say, no, 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 I, I, people try to buy me dinner. I'm always like, no, 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 I'll get it. I just, I, 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 somebody gives you something nice, the first thing you say is, I can't take this. This is too nice. I, I feel like that's the way it is sometimes in our walk with God. He begins to bless us, and we say thank you at first, and we take what God's given us, and we, we, Christian immaturity says, what can God do for me? Christian maturity says, what can I do for God? And as you begin to move into Christian maturity, you begin to say, what can I do for others? Where can I serve? Where can I give gifts? And how can I start to walk in God's love? And love means doing things for people without expecting anything in results, in, in, in return. So in, in, the, in the Old Testament, the Bible says that we need to fear God and to obey his commandments. And I found this is the secret to balancing these two 
commandments. I said there's, there's, there's no way you can get too much of this and there's no way that you can give too much of this. Worship or God's love uh, flowing in us and through us to other people. But watch this. You can never be overly balanced as well. You are or you are not. Amen. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you're off balance, you know it right away. You're either balanced or unbalanced, and you're stumbling and you're staggering. You're not halfway balanced. There's always that, that middle perfect place in God's will where you balance these things. You're, you're balanced in worship and in love, and it's a daily walk, and somebody say it's a daily battle to stay balanced in your walk with God, saying, I'm going to put God first in my life but I got to feed my family. I got to go to work. I can't just pray every day and, and, and go to church every day, worship God every minute of every hour of the day. I got to put my socks on. I got to do my responsibilities in life. And, and I feel that that's the balance that's constantly that tug of war in our lives. We get too busy for God. We get too busy for the things of God, and then we got to pull it back into balance and say, no, this has got to be the priority of my life, living for God at the foot of the cross. And then there are some times that we ask God and we're waiting on God and we're praying to God for something we need in our lives when the truth is we should be doing what we have to do until God does what He wants to do. I heard it said before, if there's a mountain to be moved in your walk with God, you should grab a shovel. Come on, if God's not going to move it, then you've got to do something. You can't just sit there. I believe there's people who wait on God and He's waiting for you. And so we get to that place spiritually where we kind of have a standoff with God. We say, well, if he doesn't do this, I'm not going to do that. That's not how God works, by the way. He's sovereign. He's, he's the king. So he's in charge. And so if you get to that place where you think, well, unless God gives me a million dollars in my bank account tomorrow, whatever unrealistic expectation we may have, and I'm believing God for great blessing and promises from heaven. And if he wants to do that, I'm ready to receive that. Amen. But if you feel like God's just going to do everything for you, He's going to do the impossible, but you have to do the possible. Come on, is it, is it making sense? We've got to have the balance in the middle of doing spiritual things and doing the practical things and keeping it all balanced because it's your season. And the devil would want nothing more than to throw you off balance. He would want nothing more than to have you reeling and running back and forth and putting out fires in your life and all the trouble over here and over there and everything's just rocking and rolling and out of balance in your life. Your life will become unmanageable. And what I'm telling somebody is there's a prince of peace in this house. Let's all stand. Come on, with the music come. There's a prince of peace that comes if you would receive him today during the holidays, come on, during this season of stress and, and a lot of things going on uh, in our families and in all these gatherings. And, and some people know these family gatherings get out of hand. I've had some pretty rowdy family gatherings. My, my family ain't saved, amen. They ain't in the church, and, and sometimes they're drinking or whatever they're doing. Come on, but we, start, we got a big family, too. So I remember going to some of these, these family gatherings, and pretty soon you got nowhere to sit down, and the crackers are gone, and the oysters are the only thing left. But luckily, I like the oysters, so I just eat all the oysters. But the truth is, these gatherings, they get out of hand, and we get stressed out, and there's a lot going on. But the promises of God, His blessings, His gifts, they are for you. They're for your life, and they're ours to distribute. That's what I want you to catch today. Not only am I saying you're blessed as God's people and you can walk in these promises, but they're also ours to distribute. Do you know how powerful it is for you to invite somebody to church during the holidays? To tell them you want to see these kids at this Christmas play. It's going to be amazing. You ought to come to our Christmas Eve service where there's such a, a presence of the Lord. And families gather together, and it'll be a candlelight thing, and, and we'll worship God. And, and I think there's somebody in Quinnell waiting for you to invite them. Come on, you can distribute a gift, a gift of God's love and, and that salvation. You'll never know what God will do on somebody when they come through those doors. Come on, it's the season. It's your season. It's your season for a breakthrough or for blessing. And, and let me just prophesy over the church this morning. If you would receive this, why don't you close your eyes or lift your hands? And I just want to prophesy over this church the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the gift of faith, 
gifts of healing in somebody's body right now. God is doing a working of miracles. Gift of prophecy. Come on. God is, is speaking to your spirit, his, into your spirit in such a way that you know it's prophetic. Discerning of spirits. He's, he's showing you what you need to do and where you, you need to go and where you need to call home and in your walk with God and diverse kinds of tongues and the supernatural speaking gifts, uh, interpretation of tongues. God's still doing these things in his church in the end time. And it's your season to learn and to grow in walking in the gifts of the Spirit. If you receive it, clap your hands unto the Lord and say amen. Receive it today that the gifts of the Spirit of God. Tell you a little bit about myself. I'll do backflips if I have to. To preach the house down, to have a good time in church. And I believe other times I got to keep it simple. And just tell it like it is and make sure you pick up what I'm laying down. So when the smoke clears, somebody doesn't say, oh, he sure preached. But what did he preach? I don't even remember what he preached. But it was good. I feel like we've received it today. God's given some gifts. Come on, there's some promises. There's some blessing. There is a place for you. Now I'm just going to be shameless. There's a place for you here at LifePoint. Amen. There's some place here for you to develop and grow in God and find out who you are. Next thing you know, you're going to say, I didn't even know God had some gifts for me. I didn't even know he was going to do supernatural things in my walk with God. But I want to challenge you today. We're going to open this altar. We're going to pray together as a church. You can pray in your seat or you can gather with the family of God at the front. We're going to raise our hands. We're going to lift our voice. We're going to worship. That's right. Come on. Continue to come as I close this morning to this place where we stand and we declare it in boldness with authority. It's my season. Amen. We don't got to be jealous when God's blessing somebody else. That's just means he's in the neighborhood. Come on, God's doing something for people this morning. You could be one of those people if you just reach, if you just reach. Come on, I'm going to close in prayer, and we're going to have a little bit of worship.